Yeah, I saw that. I saw them his first car. Father Lee, he had an old banger of a car. And we sold him another car. Sometime after we got married, you know. And he used to pop into my house and have a cup of tea with us and chat to Julie, because he knew Julie better than he knew me, really. And uh, when, he, when he bought the church, well, it wasn't a church, it was a little pokey place. You know the place at the back of the church? It's a shop now. That was the church. And uh, I think they called it St. Joseph's then. But however, uh, he... Uh, when, uh, when he bought that place, he um, used to hold the masses in the little shop where the shop is now at the back. He used to hold the masses there. But he built the hall. He built the church hall. Father Lee did. And uh, he used to hold every night, or most nights in the week, he'd hold whist drives and different things, functions. He'd have wedding functions in the hall. He'd, he'd have um, wedding receptions. He'd have He'd have dances, he'd have Saturday dances in the hall and any way he could use the hall and get a bit of money in, he'd done it, which I always admired him for. Now the priest up there now won't have, he won't have, he won't have marriage functions or anything like that. Father John no, won't, even though he's a good man, but uh, He's turned down no end of things. He could make a hell of a lot of money out of that hall if he wanted. But all he does is sell second hand clothes there. And it, of course they have tea there after the mass. So did your father come over for the for the wedding, Steve? Oh they did, yeah. Yeah. Well my father and mother come over for the wedding. And then later on the joined us in England. Oh, did they? Yeah, that? the joined us in Leicester, yeah. Yeah. My father come first. And then my mother of course, my mother we used to worry herself safe during the war, and plead, plead in with us to come, come back home. You know, really plead. She was upset, pleading with us, but we wouldn't. We wanted to stick it out. You see. Uh, but this, the newspaper, the local newspaper in Galway, done a lot of this story that I'm telling you now. They, they've. They, want, they wanted the story of when I went to England and a friend of mine who went to school with me persuaded me to go. He said that in the Connacht Tribune, which is a local paper, he said they were very interested in your story, see it. So he said, why don't you come along with me? He said, come in the Connacht Tribune office, he said, and, and tell them the story. He said, they'd like you to do that. Mm. So that's... The story that's on the paper. What inspired you to move to? Pardon? What inspired you to move to England? So your brother moved first, and then you joined him. But what inspired? What, did I want? what inspired you to move to England? Yeah, well, I had to do it because I lost my job. You see, what happened when the war started? Everybody was storing petrol. They were storing petrol because they knew there'd be a good. Be, they knew there was going to be a shortage of petrol. And of course the garages were doing no good. The garages were going out of business. This happened in Galway, it happened all over Ireland, I think. And uh, I thought there's only one thing for it. But when the boss came to me in Galway, and I worked there three years, I served my time there. I worked for three years and the boss said, Steve, I'm very sorry, call me into the office. I'm very sorry, he said, I got to let two men go. There wasn't many, there was only about five of us there, five mechanics. And uh, he said, I, let, I got to let two men go, and I, I decided to make two single men. He said, you're not married. So he said, it won't hurt you so much. But he said, I got to let you go, and another chap, 
that was working there. So they let the two of us go. Of course, I didn't have any prospect. Couldn't get a job. Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. And uh, so, so you've seen a lot of changes in, uh, but in I, Leicester, haven't you? Uh, yes, I was, and then of course I was telling them, um, a school pal of mine, Jack Ilinsky, I was telling him in Galway about it, and uh, he advised me to go to the local paper and tell the story, and that's on the paper. Yeah, Steve, the change, you know when you came to Leicester uh, first, have you noticed a lot of changes since since you first arrived? A lot of what? Changes. Oh, I Leicester. have. I have really, yeah. A lot of changes. Uh, changes, some for the better and some for the worse. But like, uh, I moved into the high fields. I got digs in the high fields when I come. And I, I was very lucky. Very lucky. My... Uh, my brother knew those two old dears that lived on their own, own in a place called Bidolf Street. And uh, they wanted just one lodger. And I went along and seen him. And I had the digs there before I got married. And they were very kind to me. They were very, very kind. And they were good cooks, both of them could cook, you know. Or Leicester ladies? In Leicester, yeah. yeah. They were in Leicester ladies. One come from Northumberland, and the other one, I think, was a friend of hers. Yeah. And the two of them lived together, you see. So these changes, Steve, what, what, what else have you seen that sticks in your mind? In Leicester, we've seen a lot of changes, really. Yeah. Some for the better, and and of course there's an awful lot of foreigners here now, as you know. <laughs> Some of them are good people, really. Like I got a Muslim this side and a Muslim that side, and they're okay here. They're good people, really. But I, they go they, they go they go to a different church than I do. Uh. And but it, uh, it took some getting used to this multiracial society. And it took some getting used to this multicultural society. Well, it did, but there wasn't so much of it. There wasn't so much of it when I first came to Leicester. It was mostly Leicester people. And how did they treat the Irish? You think? Well, the, most of them. I got on quite well with them, really. I got on quite well with them, and I'd even go. I'd even go to the pub and have a drink with them. That's the way you've got to mix, really, when you're in a different town. Did you ever go and follow the football, Steve? I did. I used to go to the football matches. Not so much. My, my sons were football mad. Uh -huh. The two of them. Can you remember any of the old games from Leicester at all? The old yeah. games? From the 40s or 50s? I can't really, no. I'm a bit forgetful now. The atmosphere. Of course, I'm... Big crowds in I, those days. I'm 85, do you see? 95, 95, 95, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, my sons love the football, and when, when uh, I got one son lives in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk, and another son lives in Anstey, I've just had the two, I didn't keep up the old traditions of the Irish, of having big families, I was determined not to do that, but anyway, th um, uh, there was nine of us in family. There was five sisters and my four, four brothers counting me. And uh, my mother always used to say, the main thing, she said, is the food on the table. And she said, even if I got to patch your trousers, she said, she said, we'll have to try and keep going. But my dad, was a very sober type of man. He'd go to the local pub and he'd have a pint of Guinness. And he always done this in Galway. And some of his pals would say, Mike, have one for the road before you go. 
He said, no, I'm going back to my family. I've had one pint and that's enough. And he was very controlled that way, the dad was. Can I ask you one question about Galway? Yeah. Did you, um, did you ever hear of Nora Barnacle? James Joyce's wife was from Galway, wasn't she? Who? James Joyce, the writer, his wife. No? Were they? Yeah. I just wondered if um, you ever heard of any stories of her or did you know, did you know that she came from Galway or... Why I ask you this, was, was Galway a small town in 19... Oh, a small town, not much happened there. Yeah. When I left Galway, there was very little happened. There was, the odd people used to come into it, but it, was a, it, it wasn't a city then. It's a city now. Uh -huh. And it, it's a... Maureen... Um, Maureen was my niece. And she was born in Leicester. And her sister, Rosemary, because my brother went back to... He retired from the company before I did. My brother did. And he sold his shares to another, another garage. And I kept in the company, do you see? And, uh, and I think I'd done another eight or nine years more. And I used to go back to Galway. And my brother would be saying, what do you think? Galway, look, this is lovely. He said, the sun is shining here. And I said, yeah, but I said, you get a hell of a lot of rain, I said. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Martin loved Galway. He was always talking about going back but I never wanted to go back because I thought I'm happy here, you know, I'm doing okay here. And, uh, but Merton was determined to go back to Galway and finish up in Galway. And the two girls who were educated in Leicester, one went to the nuns convent and the other one went somewhere else. And uh, they're over in Galway now, living in Galway. And they both married Irishmen. One married a Dublin man, another one mar married a Galway man. And uh, they love living there. And uh, but, uh, I, I like going back on holidays. Most years I go back on holidays and I enjoy it. And of course I got, I got cousins there. I was in a house once, two years ago. I got back most years. And we're in this house, the cousin's house. And they know this is when my wife Julie was alive. And uh, we visited this house. I think it's her first cousin. And uh, the, there was 18 people turned up, all relations, to this house. And of course we were all there having a drink and a meal. So I looked around and said, bloody hell, I said, I didn't realise I had so many relations. <laughs> she said, you got four or five more down the road, Steve. They'll, they'll, just, they'll see you before you go back. <laughs> this was in Connemara. I don't know whether you've uh, ever been to Connemara. Uh, um, yeah. In uh, Lesser Mullen. Place called Lesser Mullen. It's near Calro. And uh, of course, I got relations there. And I go and see them when I go. So the last time we went over, and I took my eldest son with me and his lady friend. And he done most of the driving because he likes driving my car. So over anyway, uh, he. Uh, Ginny, she's an English girl, she loved it. She loved the free and easy way they go on, you see, which they do around Connemara. And uh, I said to Kate, her name was Kate, Kate was her first cousin. I said, Kate, what's the local hotel like here? She said, it's very good, Steve. What do you want a hotel for? She said, you can stop here. I've got two bedrooms in tea. You can stop here. You're welcome to stop here. So we stopped for them. Hold on, the husband. 
her husband very quiet fella, but she had plenty to say. So Ireland is still very friendly, isn't it, in many respects like that? It is really, yeah, it yeah. is. They make us very welcome when we go. Yeah. Is there anything else which you would like and, to add? And uh, she, she couldn't... Uh, Jenny, James's lady friend, she's a nurse down in Suffolk. She comes from Bristol. She's working in Suffolk. And she's got a, she bought a house down there, you see. And that's where my son is now, my eldest son. But he, he loves that part of the country. And I know quite a bit about that part of the country because I used to drive there when, uh. Uh, when I got the job in, in Leicester. Yeah, is, is there anything else which you would like to, like to say or like to feel like we haven't really covered? Uh, is, there any, is there anything else you would like to add uh, any, about, about, about your story which you've told us? You can do really, but that's uh... about the dances, Steve. Tell us about the dances in the nineteen fifties. Pardon? Tell us about your dancing escapades of the nineteen fifties. Well, dancing, I, well, I didn't start the. I used to do dance sometimes in Coventry when I lived in Coventry, and um, of course there was a big Irish population there at the time. There is now even, and. Uh, I lived in Radford, a place called Radford, in Coventry. Did you dance at the Co-op Hall in Leicester? Where? The Co-op Hall. Yes. Yeah. I've been the Co-op Hall. Uh, we had a wedding reception there when my niece got married at the Co-op Hall. And uh, Georgina, her name is Georgina and, and Kate. Case is, she works in the market, she's worked in the market for 32 years. And the rent is there, it's terrible, the rents are very high. So I said, why don't you get the rent down? Like, why don't you pay? So she said, I will stay, and she tried it. And uh, you know what they said to her when they interviewed her? It's... Uh, I'm trying to think of the amount she pays. Quite a sum of money. It runs into hundreds. For four days a week. Four days a week she's here in. She's got her own stall there. Covered in stall. And uh, I think it's over £500 a week. For four days. It's disgraceful rent, isn't it? You've got to make some money. Too. And Kate, she's a very clever girl. Kate and my sister, she's my sister's girl. She's my niece, Kate and, and Georgina. And they're both lovely girls. There's three, but one died. And, uh, and she's been there in the market for 32 years, Kate has. And uh, sometimes she makes profits and other times she don't. And... Uh, but uh, she got married to a lesser man, and he died, of course, some years ago. And she's, um, she's got one son. He's grown up, he never got married. He's in, he's in his forties now, he is. Can I ask you one question, Steve? You're 95, what is the secret of your... Of your um, well, a lot of people ask me that, yeah. Well, uh, I've always been a careful, careful on the drinking. You know, even now when I go to the club, I have a pint of shandy, and I don't want any more, really. Less is more, then. Less is more, Steve. Or less, less is more. Less maybe is as more. a wedding, maybe as a wedding or something, I'd have more. Yeah. Mm. But uh, uh, all my brothers died. My brother Sonny died at fifty-four. Jeez. And Johnny was in his, my brother Johnny was 70 when he died. And Johnny was in the paratroops 
during the war years. And he, uh, he had a bad time. He, but he said, Steve, there's one good thing. He said, I've never killed anybody. I was at that on my conscience. So I said, Johnny, they, they killed you. They, they were shot down in Germany. As they were flying over Germany, they were shot down and ended up in hospital for 21 weeks and they sent him back to England. And he was in the military, military Colchester Hospital for six weeks. And I used to go up and down to see him. But Johnny was very adventurous. But Sonny was moving to different parts of the country to dodge the army. When he got his calling up papers. So he was a rebel. Sonny was a rebel. Do you think Johnny, Johnny, because he joined the British Army, did that contribute to his early death? Do you think, or did it was? Did that contribute to his death at fifty-four? Or? No, my other brother Sonny died at fifty-four. All oh, right. Johnny lived into his seventies, but Johnny was in the army. But uh, they had that experience in the army. They were shot down. Plane was shot down. I think it was, a, it was in a glider or something. What about Sonny? He was the wild one. Huh? Sonny what? was the wild one. He wouldn't go in the army. He was dodging. He was moving all over the country to, to dodge the army to different jobs. Did he ever marry and have children? Or? Did Sonny yeah. marry? Oh, well, yeah. He, he was the last one to get married and he was the oldest one. Sonny was the oldest of us. He was the older brother. And uh, he got married to a girl from North of Ireland. And uh, he met her in Leicester. They lived in Leicester for years and on the Mayor Road. And he got married to her. And she had, he had three sons. Didn't have any daughters. But he had three sons. And uh, soon he was... He was a reader. He'd be always reading books. And my son is the same now. But Sonny, when he lived in Galway, he'd have a torch underneath the bed clothes and he'd be reading a book with this torch. But he was like a bloody solicitor or a barrister. He had great knowledge. But he didn't put it to use. Yeah, if there's anything else you'd like to add, we'll, we'll, we'll wind it up. If yeah, any, if but uh, anyway, a lot of it is in there. Cool. And, uh, well, what we'll do, lost, Steve. what we'll do is we'll scan, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll photocopy this, yeah. we'll take some scans of it. We're going to be making... No, that was printed five years ago. <coughs> sure. I was seven... Uh, yeah, we, 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 we're going to... We're going to like a... We're going to we're going to create a nice big display okay, of, yeah. of people's stories and stuff that'll be, like that. Well, that'll be good, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to Very we're going good. to do that. And but you see, the the reporter who took me back, mm. he said, "Can you show me where you lived?" Yeah. So, so so I took him back, and the place where I lived was completely different. Yeah. Because sure. it was all thatch cottages used to be there when I mm. left in nineteen thirty nine. Mm. It was all thatch cottages. And they were all at the council houses. And I'm, and I'm standing near the wall. I'm standing near the wall there. And I'm talking to the reporter. Uh, and he's writing it down, you see. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, uh, like with this, we'll, we'll definitely take a copy of it. I'll leave a copy with you, if you can yeah. bring it with okay, you yeah. on Wednesday. Yeah. And then, we'll, then, then I can take a yeah. copy of it that way. You can add that, this one. The photograph. Are you sure? Is that an original? That's the, that's the original, yeah. Oh, I don't want to take your original. If you bring that with you on on Wednesday as well. If you just bring them both, both in on Wednesday, bring all the photos which it, you, it you want It'll be bigger, to. will it? But yeah, what, what I'll do is I'll scan them there. Yeah. But can you, can you take it off that? Yes, yes, yeah, I'll scan you that. You can have that with you. Are you sure? Yes, of course you can. You can do what you like with that. But he took my back to... He took me back to Fair Hill Road where I used to live. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Brilliant. it was 
it wasn't quite in the town, it was out of the town. And he took me back there. And my house used to be here, do you see? Yeah. And my dad's garage, my dad had a, <coughs> a garage yeah. and he used to put his lorry in. He built this garage himself. Yeah. Because there was a fair bit of ground on the mm. side, on the side of the house. Yeah. And he built the garage. And of course it just wasn't there. Yeah. But today, oh, is that walking, today, walking yeah. the dog today, Steve? Yeah. I enjoy that club, you know. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, he, he does. Great, I think it's a great club. Yeah, he does his well, best. Run, it's well run through, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, oh, it is, yeah, yeah. Okay, you, don't with the, you don't go out with the Mondays then, for the walking. You don't okay. go out Monday for the walk. You were out well, Monday? No, I didn't, time. no. Okay, so, no. We're, so... I'm not a good walker now. Uh. I've got to use a stick. Right, so I'll forget about that, it's just recording that. Okay, yeah. so, so we're, we're, we're rolling now, so I'm going to just clap my hands. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll just, if you could start off with just yeah. your name, date of birth and where you're yeah, I'll ask him that then, Dan. Okay, and yeah. then, and then, we'll, then we'll get going. All right then. Okay, one, two, three. Hello, could you tell me your name, please, and your date of birth? S Stephen Beatty, 242 Scraptoff Lane, Leicester. And where were you born, Stephen? Could you tell I'm us born, a little... I was born in Galway. Could you tell us a little bit about how you were brought up and yeah, how you Yeah, I left? can, yeah. Well... Uh, I was born in Galway in 1920, and my uh, uh, my mother and dad was in America, you see, for 12 years. And so when they come back from America, uh, my, t my two brothers were in America, you see. They were born in America, in Boston, Massachusetts. So, my dad always thought, uh, my dad went to America in 19, 1910. He went to America and he met my mother there. And she come from Galway, 30 miles from where my dad lived. And he piled up with her, you see. And they got married in America. But anyway, my brother, one of my brothers, Sonny, the one that was born in America, he uh, and Johnny, uh, they were, they come back to Galway, you see. And uh, Sonny was a rebel. He'd always answer my dad back. And my dad didn't like that. My dad rolled us like a sergeant major. And uh, Johnny, would, my other brother Johnny, was a bit easy going. But Sonny was a right rebel. And he got a job in Galway working for a, a fishmonger, of all people. And he was a sink of fish after the fish deliveries. But how about anyway? Uh, Sorry Steve, what do you mean he, by sink of fish? He, he was delivering fish to, to the local fish people. That was his job. So how about anyway? He fell out with my dad because he was answering back all the time. And my dad seen him on the lazy wall in Galway. Those blokes, layabouts, it sit on the lazy wall, they called it the lazy wall because of blokes sitting on it. It's a short little short wall in front of a building. So <laughs> he came to answer my dad. He said, I seen my dad come come and passed pass by and he seen him sitting on the lazy wall. So anyway, when Sonny, my brother Sonny, got home, my dad gave out to him, you see. I said, you with, seen you with them blackguards around the road, he said, sitting on the lazy wall, and surely you got something better to do. And Sonny was about 15 at the time, and uh, he answered my dad back. And you just didn't answer my dad back. You had to go along with him which I did many times, because he was very strict. 
But I went in there. Uh, he hurt Sonny, he really hurt him. Belted him with the sick, you know, because that was the rule at the time. So he, he Sonny cleared off and nobody could find him. All the family, my mother was worrying, say, if you've missed him for two days, nobody could find him. So in the end, one of his school pals turned up, one of Sonny's school pals. He said, Mrs. Beatty, I want to have a word to my mother. So uh, she said, yes, come in. So this lad come in. He went to school with Sonny, you see. He said, I think you should know, but your son, Sonny, is cleared off and he's gone to England. She said, England? He's got no money. How could he get to England? He's got no money. Well, I, I, I don't know the full story, he said, but uh, that's where he's gone. He's gone with a mate of his, he said. It is John Kelly, another Galway fella. And the two of them stored away on a British ship, cargo ship. And the ships used to come into Galway, you see, with cargoes. And as um, the ships come in, they were watching this sh British ship. And uh, they crawled round to it about 11 o'clock at night. And uh, during the night, this John Kelly got hungry. He said, Jesus, I'm starving, he said. I'm going to get out and see if I can get some food. So he left my brother Sonny in the, in the you know, the little cargo boats that, that the, on, the, on the ships. They were hitting one of them with the tarpaulin over. So I ran away. Uh, uh, the next thing, this bloke that was working on the ship, one of the one of the workers seen this fellow and he reported him to the captain. So the captain had the two of them arrested. So he said, ah, you adventurous Irishman. He said, I, I've seen some funny things, but I said, I haven't seen this bloke trying to throw away on a British ship. So he said, I better find you something to do. So he got the two of them shovels. He said, go down below, go down below and shovel, shovel some coal into the, to the boiler. And he said, we were hungry. And he said, uh, he said, we were suffering. And uh, of course, uh, he didn't tell me this until I come to England. Because he was in England then, my brother's son he was. He come in 1935 and Johnny come the same time. And, uh, however, um, I said t to my brother Johnny, uh, I said, he's been through it, hasn't he? But he's got him himself to blame. I said, he was bloody fo foolish falling out with my dad, I said. So, of course, he heard me. Sonny heard me. He said, you're thick and Grecian. He said, you just come from Ireland, he said. And you're telling me what to do. He said, I've been here in England since 19... Uh, I forget what, what year they went. 1935. They went. He went. I went in 1939. So, of course, he tore a strip off me for... I'm a bloody Grecian from Ireland, telling me what to do. But I hope that anyway, he... Uh, Three of us lived in Coventry, because he was in Coventry, you see, and when I joined him, and uh, we lived in a place called Radford, Radford Road in Coventry, and which is a nice part of Coventry, and uh, of course then uh, the war, the war has started, and. Uh, the three of us were in digs, three brothers, in digs together. And the, the landlady was an Irish woman. Her name was Helen Morden. And uh, 
we were all rationed with food, of course. But uh, we had to, you know, we had to, everybody else was in the same predicament, you know. We had to put up with it. So, so did you work through the, the war years? I did, yeah. 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 And uh, there was an area shelter at the bottom of the, the garden. And uh, when, there, when the sirens would go, we'd go down to the shelter. We'd all run down to the shelter. And sometimes you could be there for, for hours and hours. But the landlady always said, take some sandwiches with you. And we'd take some sandwiches and a flask of tea with us. You know, because you'd probably be overnight there very often, which we were. So, on the November Blitz, I think it was 1940, uh, we were in the shelter. And we could hear the bombing, we could hear the bombing. This shelter, I don't know whether you've ever seen one, uh, they called it Anderson, Anderson Shelter. So we were uh, right on the end of the garden, that was. And part, partly underground and partly up. The roof, the roof was on up, you know, up higher up, as you, as, as you know. And uh, we were all night from 10 o'clock at night till five in the morning in the shelter. And of course my brothers, my two brothers were smoking. I, I wasn't a smoker then. Well, I, I was a smoker for many years, but I don't smoke now. But however, uh, the all clear went at five o'clock in the morning. So we come out and went into the house. But as we went into the house, we noticed the windows were blown out. So of course there was glass all over the, there was glass all over the, the room. And the gas was escaping. So the landlady's brother, who lived in the house as well, his name was Bill Moran. Bill said, I'll go and turn the gas off. And he went and turned to him, don't attempt anybody to smoke, he said, while the gas was escaping. And uh, he turned the gas off, and then the landlady turned some tea and sandwiches for us. And, uh, and then this bit of morning said, come on, he said, we've got to get a start. And I think he went next door. He got a, borrowed a couple of shovels. There was a couple of shovels in the house, but he borrowed a couple of more shovels. And we, there we are, scooping up the glass, and the, the ceilings come down, you see. And uh, we, uh, the, the similar story to what's in this part of I'm probably tell you a bit more. But however, anyway, uh, we. Uh, we cleared it up, so then we contacted the fire station. They used to, they were the ones that used to come and put the glass in and bring people back to normal, as normal as they could. So they could put roofing felt on the window and a little bit of polythene on the top. So the landlady said to him, aren't you going to put a glass in? Oh, he said, not likely. He said, that could be blown out again. You'll have to put up with that until after the war. And that's what they've done. And uh, there we are, more live, during the daylight especially, during the day, living in, the room was dark, unless you put the lights on. But then you weren't allowed to put the lights on at night because the wardens have been coming and you've got a light on. Was that, was that the night of the big bombing in Coventry? Pardon? Was that, the, was that the big blitz in Coventry? It was, yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. It was a terrible time, really. A terrible time. And do you see, in Leicester, they didn't get much. I think there was only three or four bombs dropped in Leicester altogether. 
and uh, where, where the bombs were dropped in Leicester, we uh, we built our car showroom, my brother and me, after many years. First of all, we opened uh, an open pitch, open pitch car park, and uh, I remember that well. This is when I come to Leicester, rather. Yeah, tell us when you come to Leicester, what year was that, Steve? 1945. My brother, one of my brothers were uh, transferred from Coventry to Leicester. He worked for Armstrong Whitworth in Coventry and they had a factory in Leicester and they transferred him from Coventry to Leicester. And it, he wrote to me, because there was no phones then, he wrote to me and he said, Steve, why don't you come and live in live in Leicester, he said, it's a far more pleasant place to live in than what Coventry is, because Coventry was a, not much of a left really, very badly bombed. Every night they were at it, every night they were bombing Leicester. Or Coventry, yeah. Or Coventry, yeah, and you're all mixed up. Yeah, and uh, but however anyway, I come to Leicester and of course I'm here since, but uh, I've got no regrets living in Leicester, you know. And you found the Leicester I was, lucky, I was lucky in Leicester, yeah. really. More luckier than I was in Coventry. <coughs> what, what do you but mean Coventry, by that? The Coventry people suffered. They really suffered because there was hardly a house escaped. And uh, then, of course, uh, what next? I got a job first. Uh, Pickford's in Leicester as a driving job, driving a lorry. So one one morning, the foreman said, "We want a night driver. We want a night driver. Would any of you lads like to apply for the night driving job? You get more money." So I said, how much more? He said, your wages are trouble if you take on night driving, because I couldn't get night drivers. So I shook hands with the foreman and I said, I'm on. I'll do it. And I'd done that for four or five years. And uh, uh, first of all, it was hard, because we were driving in the blackout. And the first trip we done was to London and they sent a driver with me to show me the way, do you see? So, uh, the, yeah, he showed, showed me the way and he said, no, you'll have to do it on your own and I had to do it on my own. To Bermondsey. It was more or less a straight journey, really. But then, of course, you had, when you got to near Bermondsey, you, you lost your way, you had to inquire. And uh, their depot, them, their depots all over the place, Pickford said, they were a very big, very big com a haulish company. And uh, the Oh yeah, when the when the when the four men said no, you left to do it on your own. So and so has been with you, and he showed you the way. So now you left to do it on your own, Steve. So I said, okay. So I got that, and there's no motorways. You had to go through all the villages and what have you. So I started off with Northampton and and uh, then uh, when I got to Northampton, it was an Arctic. Well, I was used to shunting them really, more shunting them than driving them really. And uh, they were different on the reversing. I don't know whether you have ever driven in there, but they were different on the reversing. You had to get used to the, the reversal. 
So there wasn't much traffic on the road at all at that time. So what did I do? Northampton it took me six about six times before I got the hang of it of this outtake. I could drive one forward or I put the reverse and I wasn't too well up on. So I started diversing in a quiet I found a quiet road in Northampton and I started diversing. It took me about six times to get the bloody hang of it. So when I got to Bermondsey, the foreman called me Paddy, Paddy. Uh, there's a space here, reverse in there. So I reversed in there. I'm very proud of myself, I'll tell you. I've done it. I got the hang of it, you see. I thought, I'm, I'm away, I'm away. So at that time I used to do many trips to London. Leeds, John Castor, all over the country really. I was driving this lorry, you see, to, you had to go different places. And I got quite, I got quite, quite an expert on it in the end. And but my wages went right up, and that's what tempted me to go on nights. And I'd done that for four or five years, the, the, the night driving. But uh, there was no power steering in them days. And my arms used to ache, my shoulders ached, my eyes ached when you get back in the morning. Because you'd be about 12 hours or so altogether on the road. But uh, I got the hang of it in the end. And you saved some money up then from, from that? And did you save some good money up from that? Well, I did. I got very good money. And, and of course, I wasn't a, a drinker, you know, at that time. Well, I'm not a drinker now, really. I have a pint of shandy and that's all I have. But uh, the, the, um, it was uh, the only... The only social life we had was when you went to the transport cafe and met the other drivers and they'd be telling you their experiences. And that was the only social life I used to look forward to because there was no pleasure or pleasurable things to do really during, during the war years. And uh, it, was a, it was a strange life really you know, compared to what I'm used to now. And then, of course, later on, with my brother, my brother Martin, and he was the first one that started the business. And he was doing car repairs in a little garage in Leicester. Little garage in Edmonton Street. Don't know what they know. Spark North Street, St. Peter's Road. And this was... Uh, It was well after the war when we started there, and uh, I'll tell you in a minute the exact year. 1947, I think. 46 or 47, we started in the business, the two of us, Martin and me. But Martin was the first one that was there. Martin was my younger brother. He was two years younger than me. And uh, he always wanted to go in the motor trade instead of working for somebody else. So the two of us branched out anyway later. I joined him about 12 months after because I was still working for Pickford's then. And Martin said, why don't you come in with me, Steve? He said, i got plenty of work. Well, of course, I served my time in Galway as a mechanic. I've done three years in Galway as a mechanic. And of course, I had a good idea about cars, you know. But uh, uh, we started. We started then in Sparkle Old Street in this little garage, and uh, opposite opposite the garage, there was two houses bound. Two houses, one next door to each other, and all the brick rubble was there. And it did look a mess. And that was bombed in 1940. 
and it was never cleared away. It lay there all during the war, and I think it was a good many years after the war uh, when we decided to buy the property, as it was, all brickwork, rubble, and it was laying there for years. So we uh, we had it cleared off. An Irishman, fellow by the name of Jimmy Jackson, he was in the building trade. And uh, he cleared it off and there was 104 lorry loads of brick rubble and rubbish and old bedsteads and everything's chucked on there. And it was right opposite our garage where we were working. And it was such a bloody eyesore. So anyway, when we cleared it off, we fenced it in all around. We had the local builder do that. He fenced it in and he put two gates on. And... Uh, the, the local people come out because there were all terraced houses along there. It was right on a corner of St. Peter's Road and Sparkano Street. Do you know Saxby Street? Well, it's the street opposite Saxby Street. And uh, the local people come out shaking hands with us. You're the best, you're the best people we've seen here in years. You've managed to clear this bloody place off and it looked an eyesore and we had to put up with this, put up with all this for, over the war. And he said, you lads have come along and, and you made the place all we, we put flower boxes all around and that made an open pitch. And we had that, we run that for quite a number of years. And then later on we had the care showroom, which is there. There's a picture of it there. The care showroom built. Steer at the bottom under that block. That looks grand, Steve. There's a close up on it. Thank you. Yeah, what we'll do is we, we will um, yeah. scan it and, and, and we'll oh, put yeah. it in and we'll add it. So, into what were your impressions of the Leicester people when you first Just, just one second. Could I just. Uh, well, the dad used to call me Paddy and I didn't like it. They called me Paddy and they kept calling me Paddy. But uh, then later on, later on they changed the name over to my brother Martin. I called him Paddy. <laughs> he, he, he didn't mind it. He, he didn't mind it, but I didn't like it. Oh. Yeah, but the Leicester people were okay with really. So did you go to many of the dances in Leicester? Did you, Dance? did you socialise in Leicester? Did you go to the dances? I did, yeah. We used to go to the Circular Hall. The Circular Hall, Joe Willis run it. And uh, then I met a girl in Leicester. She was Irish, she, she come from County Limerick. And her name was Julie McGrath. And I married Julie, and we were married for 61 years. She was a great woman. She died about seven years ago. She was a nurse. She first of all she she done general nursing, and then she done mental nursing. And she lo she loved her job. She only had the one job all the time. And so did you get married in Leicester? We got married. Father Lee married us. Do you remember Father Lee? Yeah, what a great man he was. He had the Saint Joseph's Church. He come from some. He, he worked in Lincolnshire, Father Lee did, and uh, he moved to Leicester. Why he moved to Leicester, I don't know, because he worked in, he was eight, eight or nine years in Lincolnshire, and he loved it. But then when he came to Leicester, he was a curate in St. Joseph's, and, uh, and, one day I, I was in the garage and I seen those black trousers and black shoes and I thought and he stooped down I was underneath the car standing underneath the car servicing the car he said can you tell me where I can find Steve Beatty I said Gerald you're talking to him I said oh well he said 
I've just been talking to your, um, she's going to be your wife, Julie. Oh, I said, news travels fast, don't it? He said, yes, he said, I go into the Towers Hospital, he said, and see her. And she's going to get married to you on January the 4th. That's right, I said. And he said, I'd be in my church. Because that was her church.